Hello and welcome to our video on the first half of lecture notes from section 4.4. This is all about inverse trig review. So this is a sort of topic that's easy to forget. Um, and so it's probably for most of us worth going over, maybe even before we think about the rest of 4.4. Um, so this, the other part of 4.4 is all about how do we take derivatives of inverse trig functions, All right? So that's the next part. This first part we'll focus on in this video the meaning of inverse trig functions. What the hell are they? Um, and how to compute with them. So maybe I should say it's the meaning um, and use or computation of inverse trig functions. Okay, so um, I guess I'll start, sorry, I scrolled around too much. I guess I'll start with uh, my own sort of view of this, uh, sort of drawing this from scratch. What we'll first notice is if you recall what we talked about from section 4.1, it really shouldn't make sense to talk about inverse trig functions, right? Like um, our sine function, its graph looks something like this blue curve I'm trying to draw. So this is y equals sine of x. And so I want to talk about the inverse sine function, but it's impossible to talk about since sine of x fails the horizontal line test. And we know from our discussions in 4.1 material, this tells us the inverse sine function, which is also called the arc sine function, can't exist. Right, you can really see this on the sine graph. There are lots of vertical lines that right to draw them, some of them. This graph crosses more than once. So if we try to reflect this graph through the line y equals x, the reflected inverse object would fail the vertical line test and so wouldn't be a function. So to fix this, um, to fix this, we only invert the sine function on an interval where it does pass the horizontal line test. And so we say we're not going to we're not going to talk about inverse of sine for this whole blue graph. I'll just talk about inverse of sine for a part of it. And let me highlight maybe O oh, in, in uh, green, the part we're going to talk about. It's this part. That green part, that's the part of the sine function that we're going to be able to invert. So I'll even maybe sketch a little bigger picture here, zoomed in picture, if you will. That green part, right, uh, looks something like this. Sorry for my poor drawing skills. And so what are we, how are we restricting it? We're, le we're not letting x go past pi over 2, and we're not letting it go before negative pi over 2. That's the interval where we're restricting. And this little piece of the sine function now passes the horizontal line test, and so I can invert it. And if I scroll down, I'll show you a nice picture of what the inverse sine graph looks like. So there's the sine of x, and then when I invert it, this piece of it, I get this new function. And something we should point out, like I did before, let me make these diagrams now just a little bit thicker. Um, for example, 
the sine of pi over 2 is 1, so we go through the point pi over 2 comma 1, and the inverse graph goes through that reflected point, it goes through 1 comma pi over 2. Similarly, um, when the input for sine is pi over 4, the output is root 2 over 2. And so that point corresponds to this other point on the inverse sine graph. That's at root 2 over 2, comma pi over 4. So this process of relating or understanding the sine, the inverse sine function by always relating it back to the sine function, that's actually how we understand a lot of inverse sine calculations. All right, so we can also talk about the inverse tangent, and it has a similar problem as shown in this graph. You can see in this graph that the tangent function also very poorly fails the horizontal line test. And so we do the same thing. Let me zoom in a little bit. We are going to only look at one piece of the tangent function, and we're only going to invert that piece. So the piece we look at is right here, just the piece where x goes between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. We can take that blue piece, because that, that part passes the horizontal line test, we can reflect it across the line y equals x, and the new curve we get deserves to be called the graph of the inverse, or arc tangent. So that's the piece we're going to reflect, and here is the new piece we get that we're going to call the inverse, or arc tangent graph. Okay. Right, so I'll just point out one point that I know is on this graph, um, on this inverse tangent graph. When x is 1, I know that the y value is pi over 4. And how do I know that? Why do I know that's true? What I'm really saying is that the arc tangent, the inverse tangent of 1 equals pi over 4. Why on earth is this true? This is true because 1 is equals the tangent of pi over 4. Similarly, we're going to try to take an inverse of the cosine function. It has similar problems. The only thing that's going to be different here is the interval we're going to restrict for cosine to make it pass a horizontal line test is not centered at the origin. So um, pi, sorry, pi, sine and tangent, we said, oh, look between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 for both of those. But for cosine, we look from x equals 0 all the way to x equals pi. And we just take this little piece of the cosine graph, and this is the one we're going to invert. We're going to flip it across the line y equals x and we get the arc cosine graph. Okay, so that's just how these functions are kind of defined. Um, and so let's try an example of where we're going to maybe compute with a sign, with an arc sign um, or inverse sign. So this is a pretty typical type of question that you've um, worked with at some point in your trigonometry class, or your pre-calc class, I should say. And here's the way I always encourage my students there to think about it. To compute the inverse sine of some weird thing, well, I'm going to call that weird thing an angle. I'm going to say theta equals the inverse sine of whatever they're telling me, in this case, negative 1 over root 2. And the reason I always encourage people to write it like this is because it's natural when you call your output theta, it's natural to rewrite this thing. Well, whatever theta equals, what I'm really saying is that the sine of theta, 
must equal negative 1 over the square root of 2. Right? To solve this first equation, I really probably want to think about it in terms of the original inverse inverse function. This one sounds a little bit more familiar. You might be making guesses here. Oh, maybe theta is pi over 4. Well, that won't work because sine of pi over 4 is 1 over root 2, so that was not good. Um, you might try theta equals 3 pi over 4. That one also doesn't work because the sine of 3 pi over 4, as you remember, is also 1 over root 2. And then you might say, oh, well, theta equals 5 pi over 4 could work. And it turns out that's true. The sine of 5 pi over 4 is negative 1 over root 2. So this seems to work, but I want to point out a cautionary warning here. This doesn't really work because whenever we use inverse sine or, in, or arc cosine notation, we are assuming um, we are assuming that the angles, the, the angle outputs, are between um, negative pi over 2 and, oops, I'll, call, I'll make it an interval, uh, and pi over 2. Right? That's, we had to restrict the sine graph to have those inputs, and then, so it passed the horizontal line test. And then when we create the inverse sine function, these are the inverse sine outputs. This is where the outputs for inverse sine live. And 5 pi over 4 is not in here. So how do we solve this question? We need um, an angle that is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, so that when you plug it into sine, you get negative 1 over root 2. And if you do some thinking here, you will find that the answer that works is negative pi over 4. Okay. All right, let's try the um, inverse cosine of 1 half. Um, oops, excuse me a second. So I want, oops, I'm sorry. I want, um, I'm going to view this as an unknown angle equals the inverse cosine of 1 half. That encourages me to rewrite this as cosine of that angle equals 1 half. And here's where I can use my knowledge of trig functions. I can say, oh, I know lots of places where that happens. Uh, let's see, pi, pi over 3, is that right? Oh, excuse me. So I'm getting a phone call. Um, no, sorry, pi over, yeah, pi over 3 um, is one place where that happens. Another place uh, where that happens is uh, 5 pi over 3. Uh, maybe another place where this happens. There's actually lots of answers that, that we could come up with. Um, oh, let's see. Negative pi over 3. Um, but keep in mind... To talk about the inverse cosine, we had to restrict the cosine of theta. We needed theta for to invert the cosine function. We said we're always going to have this between 0 and pi. So it can't be this one. It can't be this one. Oh, this one works. So the answer here is pi over 3. Okay, so our notes also talk about um, dealing with the inverse or arc secant function, and they mention, so I'll let you guys read about it, that this is the interval where we can talk about um, inverting secant, and this interval over here is where we can talk about inverting cosecant.
Oops, sorry, excuse me. All right, so, um, to keep this video a little shorter, I want to skip example three and move on to example four. Uh, because this might feel like something you might want to take some time to review. Um, it might seem a little more confusing than example three. Okay, so how on earth do I do this? The inverse sine of the cosine of some angle. Well, I usually think about this one using, um, excuse me, using right triangles. It's a little bit weird, uh, so let me just show you. Um, well, but but you can also set this up without using right triangles. So we have the inverse sine, the arc sine of this giant cosine of 2 pi over 3, that is equal to some mysterious angle. So I'm going to rewrite that as saying the cosine of 2 pi over 3 needs to equal the sine of my mysterious angle. And the one thing I want to point out, sort of remind us before we keep going, is that because I use the inverse sine notation, that tells me that this theta has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So there might be lots of values for theta I could put in here to solve to make this true, but um, I only want the one that's between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, so it turns out this isn't terribly hard um, to figure out. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the one value of theta that we can get in, in this interval that should work should be uh, negative pi over six. And how did I figure this out? Well, cosine of 2 pi over 3, that one I can figure out from my trig knowledge. That's negative 1 half. And so I'm really trying to figure out what value, what, what do I plug into sine to get 1 half? Um, sorry, to get negative 1 half. To get positive 1 half, I'd plug in pi over 6. To get negative 1 half, there's a lot of numbers I could pick, but to stay between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, I'd plug in negative pi over 6. Okay, example five is a really good one. Um, so let me, I think example five includes the example I was trying to skip before. Oh, no, it doesn't. Okay, so I'll leave that one skipped. Okay, so I gotta be a little careful with the, oh my gosh, with example five. Um, first thing we wanna do is figure out what is the inverse tangent of negative root 3. And what I could do there is say, oh, that's going to be, I'm looking for an angle whose tangent is negative root 3. Okay, um, <clears throat> but keep in mind, that for when we're talking about inverse tangent, we need to have this restriction on theta. Oh, excuse me. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, and so once I use some trig, where am I? Once I use some trig for this, we can solve this and learn that theta must in fact equal um, negative pi over three. Okay, and so now I'll plug that in and I'll have that the cotangent of the 
inverse tangent of negative root 3, that will equal the cotangent of negative pi over 3. And the cotangent of negative pi over 3, well, that's just the cosine of negative pi over 3 divided by the sine of negative pi over 3. And so we can sort of crank this out. Um, the cosine of negative pi over 3 is just 1 half, and the sine of negative pi uh, over 3 is negative root 3 over 2. And so I think I get exactly, excuse me, um, negative 1 over root 3. All right. And now they're trying to scare us with these last bit of examples where we want to, um, we might want to use some of these old trig formulas to simplify a problem before trying to compute some stuff. So I'll quickly go through this one. Hopefully it's helpful. If not, please feel free to consult your old trig notes. But um, what I have here is the sine of two times something. So that's sine times two, and I'm just gonna call it alpha, like in the identity up above. That's gonna be two sine of alpha times the cosine of alpha. And so here, what I'm calling this Greek letter alpha is the arc sine of five over 13. So this will be two sine of the arc sine of 5 over 13 times the cosine of the arc sine of 5 over 13. Now this first thing we're going to be able to do very easily because we're plugging in a number into our arc sine function and then we're taking a sine of it so these two will cancel because they're inverses. And so we'll get 2 times 5 over 13. It'll be 10 over 13. But now we've got to figure out this last one, the cosine of the arc sine of 5 over 13. OK, so here's where um, I like to use right triangles. Sort of generally speaking, when someone asks you to compute a trig function of another inverse trig function. Right triangles is often helpful. So this should feel familiar compared to your trig classes. So I'm going to make a right triangle, and maybe I'll call that theta, and this will be the 90 degree angle. Um, and so when I say theta, I don't know what it, the arc sine of 5 over 13 is. I'm going to call that theta, right? That's the same thing as saying the sine of theta is 5 over 13. And sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Um, and some of you may recall that for um, a right triangle, with one side length 5 and the hypotenuse 13, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to get the other side is 12. And so when I was asking, when this problem was asking for the cosine of this arc sine thing, I'm really asking for, well, what's the cosine of this theta in this picture? And that's just adjacent over hypotenuse. And so our final answer for this little computational question is 10 over 13 times 12 over 13, otherwise known as 120 
over 169. Okay, so after this point is when we start talking about derivatives of inverse trig functions. So what I'm going to do is stop this review here, um, and hopefully that was helpful. I think testing your current understanding with new and current quiz questions and homework exercises would be a great idea. Alright guys, I'll make another video as soon as I can.